Hello. Before we begin, I wanted to let you know about the launch of a brand new series from top business and careers podcast, 40 Minute Mentor. Hosted by James Mitra, founder of JBM and LinkedIn's top voice for careers, there's so much to learn from this series. From purpose-led founders to Olympic champions, learn firsthand from today's leaders what it takes to be brilliant. The newest series features guests such as Paralympic royalty and crossbench peer Baroness Tani Gray-Thompson, Graham Hobson of Photobox, and FT columnist and author Elizabeth Uwe Biene. Listen to 40 Minute Mentor on any of the popular podcast platforms. Nestled within a wide network of estates in London's Clerkenwell is the Finsbury Health Centre, a modernist masterpiece designed by Georgian British architect Bertold Lublikin in the early 20th century. Built around Lubetkin's maxim that nothing is too good for ordinary people, it once held a dentist office, a thriving GP surgery, podiatrists and even a solarium. It even featured in World War II propaganda as a model of living that Britons should be fighting for. But these days, it's a shadow of its former self and almost a ruin. During the past few decades, it feels as if ordinary people have faced waves of economic and social misery. We're living through economic stagnation that's been compounded by COVID, a cost living crisis, and potentially the long term effects of Brexit, still unknown. Here with me today is Torsten Bell, the Chief Executive of the Resolution Foundation, an independent think tank whose main aim is to raise the lot of ordinary people. He's the captain of the stern of the ship, pointing out the economic and social icebergs far in the distance that others can't yet see. Thanks for joining us today, Torsten. Good to be here. Pleasure to have you on the We Society podcast. Um, When we invited you to join the We Society podcast, uh, when you heard the words We Society, did you think how odd or did it immediately kind of of strike a bell with you? Uh, Well, I thought Will Hutton is asking me to come on a podcast with him. (laughs) Who is going to turn down uh, that chance? um, And unsurprisingly, we're pro uh, a bit of society. Well, there is such a thing as society. So I thought, what a great name for a podcast. (laughs) On we go. Now, look... um, You've been in government. You're now chief executive of the Resolution Foundation. Been a remarkable success story. Uh, and Stagnation Nation. We had the interim report out of this uh, piece of work. You're working with the Centre for Economic Performance at the LSE. But um, reading it, I'm very struck that this is not just an economic diagnosis of Britain. Uh, streamed through it, you have references to training, references to human capital, references to institutions, what is afflicting British society, and it really impacts on your economic diagnosis. How fair is that? I think that's totally fair. I don't think anybody operating, or at least anybody sensible operating in the economics policy space, thinks that you can separate out the success of your society from that of your economy. We are, um, you know, economies are complex beasts, they're complex ecosystems, their strength is grounded in the strength of the society within which they operate in terms of ways of working, lots of the inputs, you know, in our economic um, work, obviously, they often appear as uh, numbers or as symbols. But in the real world, we're talking about people, the skills they have, the knowledge they have, the organisations they build. And there isn't some way of separating those things out, or there isn't at least a useful way of doing it. Yeah, you talk about differential life expectancy, you talk about, uh, I mean, some of the skill deficits for the disadvantaged, you talk about uh, the way people are trapped by the labour market in, in parts of the country they can't get out of by the kind of poverty of the benefit system. I mean, it's, a, you know, it's uh, uh, alongside, you know, big criticisms of, you know, low investment, etc., etc. Uh, again, I mean, spell it out. Well, look, we've got, you know, we've got choices as a society. They're not all about how our economy works. I'll give you an example. Half of shift workers in Britain get less than a week's notice of when they're working hours, what their schedules are for the week ahead. You know, now that gets talked about as if it's an economic issue, but that is a really big social choice we're making, giving millions of people lack of certainty about how they live their lives. Yes, it's about the economic part of their lives, but does anyone think that doesn't impact every single aspect of their lives if you don't know what hours you're going to be working the week after? I mean, I couldn't live my life 
You know, it's already complicated enough trying to manage, you know, life, work, friends, uh, some attempt at a social life. So the idea that you can do that around that kind of uncertainty, and that's a policy choice. Some countries choose to require people to have notice of their shift patterns. We don't. How weakly regulated is the British labour market by international standards? Well, generally, we have a, uh, a deregulated labour market that obviously has pros to it in terms of when there's when there's been phases when, for structural reasons, we've seen growth in employment, as we saw strongly over the course of the last 10 years, then the flexibility of our labour market certainly sped up how quickly people's wish to work more could translate into higher employment levels. Then, but I think the, one of the dangers we've had since the 1980s is that we, we've said to ourselves, we don't want the 1970s. We don't want a rigid labour market, particularly with highly um, sectorally organised and lack of choice about wage levels in different sectors. We don't want that because it brings with it macroeconomic challenges. And if you're from a certain perspective, it also brought with it a lack of flexibility that stopped people uh, innovating, improving, taking risks. The people have looked at that, taken that lesson from the 80s and then concluded and, and also, to be fair, looked at some of the benefits of a flexible labour market in terms of people being able to live the life that they want to lead. But they then, and for firms to be able to grow their workforce when they are seeing opportunities, but they've looked at that and said there's, it's not worth trying to do any better. And if we do, it's very dangerous. If we try anything that improves the lot of those on lower incomes or provides their, uh, for more certainty in people's working lives, that, that will be very risky. And that is unusual. You don't see that, for example, in New Zealand. You don't see it in some US states. People with Anglo-Saxon labour markets pretty similar to ours are experimenting much more with what labour market policy, labour market institutions can do to raise the quality of life of people. And it isn't just about pounds and pence. The big example of our progress in this area is the minimum wage. And we've had political you know, contestation over the success of that of the last 20 years. But what we haven't had is imagination beyond that. What else would make a difference to low-income workers um, to improve their lives beyond their weekly pay. What else would make a difference? Well, I'll give you a really, you know, I think one really important thing that's missed a lot in conversations in policy is the people that are low-paid on an hourly basis are increasingly not the same people who are low-paid on a weekly basis. And in the end, your weekly pay, which is determined by your hourly pay rate and the number of hours you work, is what matters for your living standards. And increasingly, those people who are low paid on a weekly basis aren't the lowest paid when it comes to the minimum wage, or they're not on the minimum wage often. And so um, as much of an issue as how much you get paid per hour, which the minimum wage has made a massive difference, hugely transformed the lives of lots of low earners in the last 20 years, is the fact that people either can't get the hours that they want, or if they can, they come with so many difficult trade-offs that they don't feel able to take them up. For example, the lack of certainty about when the hours would actually take place. Does public policy discuss what we can do to make a difference on that front? Not at all. You're a social scientist. And I'm president of the Academy of Social Science. This is a social science podcast. I mean, as you kind of look at kind of Britain and analyse it, again, I want to ask you, I mean, to what extent do your do you see it through a kind of social science prism? Or, I mean, when you're talking, as you just have, about um, hourly and weekly pay packets and then the cascade effect on people's lives, um, that has an impact on, of course, how they, how they spend, uh, whether they can invest in training, how, holding their families together and all of that. But um, that's not an economics discourse normally. But that's the way you seem to think. Yeah, I think in terms of, I mean, look, I'd say like our organisation, our ways of thinking is let's take social science to reality and where the two meet is where you will make progress in terms of understanding your country and thinking about how to improve it. Because lots of things we can tell and we, you know, we're largely a quantitative focused organisation, um, but we often do make sure that we make time for quantitative research, focus groups, not necessarily um, uh, that we always publish that, but to make sure that we are both interpreting the data in a way that feels true to people's lived experience, but also to make sure that we're asking the right questions. Like, what is it that people want from their lives? What do they think about the things that we are concluding from the data? So I think you, you, you know, there are times when you've got a nice, simple question. For example, uh, who will gain from a tax cut is something I feel very confident saying. I can tell you the answer from that using our standard quantitative analysis. But questions about, for example... Is it a good or a bad thing that we're seeing lower mobility, job-to-job -job moves from people over the course of the last this century? 
Fewer people move jobs than did at the turn of the century. Fewer people move between places for jobs, despite everybody always telling me that everyone's moving jobs these days. Whenever I talk to a chief exec, they say, oh, the problem with the young workers today, they're always job hopping every five minutes. It's complete nonsense. People are moving jobs. Less young people should move jobs more because moving jobs is the way you receive a good pay rise in your 20s. Anyone that's young listening to this, not that you and I aren't young, Will, but anyone <laughs> actually... Speak for yourself, George. Anyone <laughs> actually young, Mr. President, should be moving jobs in their 20s because that's how you secure large pay rises and your level of... And and your chance of earning more is pretty much, is very importantly determined by what happens to you in the early parts of your um, career. So moving jobs is a good thing. What do we think about that? Well, look, that isn't solvable. The spreadsheet doesn't tell you whether that's a good or a bad thing. If you look just at pay, it's definitely a bad thing. But some reduction in mobility may be a good thing. For example, in the 1980s, people had to move between places because there were very, very large parts of the country with low employment rates. And so you had to move to find work. That's less true these days. There's very few parts of the UK that have such high unemployment rates that you need to move out to find a job. You may you may need to move to find the right kind of job, but to move to any work, that's not the same as it was in the 80s. So there's some good reasons why job mobility might have gone down, but there's also bad reasons. I mean, there's a whole host of them. Higher housing costs in higher earning areas mean it doesn't make sense to move from Scarborough to Leeds for a better job anywhere more in a way that it would have done in decades past. That's bad for the country as a whole, lower productivity. It's bad for workers who can't access those opportunities. Now, what's our balance between weighting the good reasons why people might not be moving with the bad reasons? I think we should go and talk to them. How how serious a situation do you think Britain is in, in kind of the autumn of 2022? I mean, we're in a very, very serious situation. And I think we need to think about the sh- there are short term aspects of that, lots of which are shared, particularly across advanced European economies. And then there are British specific aspects of that. So if we look at the short term drivers of the challenges we face, clearly, we're managing to combine two big public policy challenges, a cost of living crisis driven largely by rising gas prices in Europe as a result of the conflict in Ukraine, those that is exerting that is for energy importers like us making us poorer as a country, and it's placing particular burdens on lower income households who find coping with those higher energy bills an essential we all need to pay particularly difficult. So that is a really big challenge, and that's happening at the same time where they're related, although not entirely uh, the same story about a move back towards higher interest rates which at one level you know people have been saying oh you know we've been saying you should always be ready for that that could always have happened well it's happened very fast and we've now got a big adjustment to make for our economy from an area where we thought interest rates of one two percent was normal you know and we didn't get back to that level very often and now we are expecting interest rates to head up towards 5 6% and then to the long term normal to be nearer 4%. That is a huge change. It means big shifts in asset prices, big shifts in the relative positions of those who save and those who need to borrow. Then it will change the context for the public finances, for public spending decisions, all a host of things. And we're having to wrestle with that. And that was always going to be really difficult, whoever was in government, and it will be difficult for countries around the globe. But we are then doing that, this cost of living crisis and this macroeconomic change of regime happening at the same time as we're a country that has been through a really difficult 15 years of relative decline. And I know people don't want to say that. And it's as a country, we often, you know, we don't, there's lots of great things about Britain, loads of brilliant things happening. I was cycling here through central London just now, seeing lots of new businesses setting up, energies back, you know, lots of great things going on. But the big picture of the last 15 years is of one of Britain in being in relative decline. Liz Truss is right on that front to point out that low growth has been a serious problem. And although, you know, lots of people, it's quite fashionable to say, oh, who needs growth? It doesn't affect real people. Well, I would say the reason why wages in 2023 will be back to the levels we had in 2003, so 20 years of lost wage growth, is because this economy has not been growing. So growth isn't something that only economists should worry about. This is about wages of real people, their living standards. We've been growing, almost all of our similar advanced economies have been growing faster than us over that period. They've all seen slower growth than they might have liked, but they've seen faster growth now, than us. Now, why has Britain grown slowly? Well, there's a whole host of and stagnating things going on. Well, I think so. A lot of the so the stagnation. I think I think the word stagnation. I think of it. This is not its usual meaning, but I think the stagnation that Britain faces is that slow growth of the last 15 years being combined with the high inequality that this country has had now for four decades. And the reason the two together are so toxic is that if you are very unequal and you have a lower GDP per capita than you would like to have or that similar, other similar economies have, then the, the, the middle and the bottom of the income distribution, low and middle income households, 
have much lower living standards than they would otherwise have. So I'll give you a concrete example. Poorer households in Britain are now 20% poorer than poorer households in France. It's not two, it's not three, five, they're 20% poorer. That is the country that is then confronting uh, the crisis of higher energy bills. So these are not, you know, it's, it's so people, the critique of social science is we sit in our ivory towers, I literally work in a white building, right? So <laughs> it's fair enough, but that in the real world is a lot of money. And it isn't just the very bottom. If you look across what we would think of as similar economies to us, so let's think about France, Germany, the Netherlands, and not just European countries, let's do Canada and Australia together, okay? So those five economies, those are ones I think most people in Britain would think of as being about the same as us. They're not Norway, they're not some kind of socialist nirvana with loads of oil and money, and they're not America, hugely unequal, but hugely productive too. They're like normal-ish economies from our perspective. Clearly, globally, they're very rich countries. But all of those five are more equal than us and richer than us. So the idea that the reason we've got slow growth is is because we've been too focused on reducing inequality or too much redistribution is for the birds. All of those five economies are richer and they are more equal. As a result, if um, if in Britain today we had the, the average GDP per capita of those five countries and their average level of inequality, then the typical household in Britain would be £8,800 richer. This That's an not, amazing number. It's, it's huge. Amazing number. Yeah. It is huge. That is what slow growth and high inequality together do. That is why we say that Britain is a stagnation nation. And that should be the thing that motivates people in the 2020s. We should be about, we've got to get inequality down and we've got to get growth up. Just a quick break in the conversation to talk to you very briefly about the organisation behind the WE Society. The Academy of Social Sciences is a national body for academics, practitioners and learned societies in the social sciences. As the president of the Academy, I can tell you that we champion the vital role social sciences play in education, in government, in business, the list goes on. From listening to the podcast, you'll hear that social scientists are at the forefront of tackling the most pressing issues of our time, from the cost of living crisis to the war in Ukraine. In every public or private sector strategy room in London, Edinburgh, Cardiff or Belfast, you'll find a social scientist. You can find out more about the Academy of Social Sciences' work, support us, or read up on our fellows by going to the website acss.org.uk. That's acss.org.uk. You can follow us on Twitter at ACADSOCSciences and tell us what we should be covering, who we should be speaking to, by emailing wesociety at acss.org.uk. Now, back to the conversation. I mean, the figures are stark, but I mean, why is public investment so poor? Why is private investment so poor? Why have we allowed inequality to get to these levels? Um, is the course on which the current government is set likely to resolve any of these issues? And I'd say a lot of it is we're not serious about sorting it out. You know, when people say they want to see inequality come down, they talk about small changes to the tax or benefit system. Or, if I, you know, if you're talking with a corporate board, they'll say, oh, no, that's really we, we, we do, must have a more equal society. So we're doing, you know, we're fo really focusing on ESG um, as if they're corporate. It's environmental, societal yes. and government yes. investments. No, 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 that's going to make a huge difference. That's where the and it's just not that's not serious. That isn't if you want to see inequality fall in this country, then it requires much more radical interventions the idea that it's not going to involve changes to your labor market in a really fundamental way is for the birds you know people that said the min a higher minimum wage was impossible 20 years ago have learned a hard lesson that actually you can choose policy choices can make a huge difference can reduce low pay in britain remember low pay has been falling now consistently for the last decade that's the first consistent fall in 40 years and actually we're on low pay we're now back to levels we haven't seen since the 1970s and that's because a policy that was thought through was evidence-based by social science that said look although the textbooks say you can't have a minimum wage or a higher minimum wage actually the way the real world works means that we can't see a big loss of employment if you go ahead with that um, a government had seen that evidence came forward with a process for introducing it with institutions to underpin that and it's been a complete triumph under part, both parties over the course of the last 20 years. So we're going to need more than that, not just people saying that they're looking at ESG when they're reporting their... So what fundamental things would be required? Well, we need, we're going to have to look at different institutions. We're going to have to say, do, you know, are we happy with the fact that... I'll, I'll give you a really concrete example that I always stays with me. I was once on a... I got off a plane at Stansted. I was getting a train back into London. It was early in the morning. It must have been like five or six. And um, I, I sat down on the train 
they, um, a guy came on and sat down opposite me. He had in his hand his sandwich. Um, and just as he sat down and the doors closed, the, um, his phone went. And he answered the phone. The, um, uh, and I could only hear his half of the conversation, obviously. But basically, he was on his way in, 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 into work. And his employer was ringing him and saying, I don't need you today. I don't need you, sorry, just go back home. And he said, um, oh, I've already paid for the train ticket and I paid for the childcare and I've already bought my lunch and I'm on my way. And the, and the guy was saying to me, well, it's really interesting, but I don't need you today, so don't come in, you're not going to get paid. Now, you know, do we think that's a good way to run a country? I couldn't pay my mortgage if that was the nature of my employment relationship. We all know these things go on. You don't have to go and sit on a train and find out about it. We can see it clearly in the data and we can see it, you know, in our lives, with our, you know, whether it's for young people or friends who are living in those kinds of circumstances for their work and then we let it continue and if you want to see inequality come down then we need to stop pretending that that doesn't require change for those kind of things and obviously you know the same thing is true on growth like i spend too long talking to politicians again of both main parties whose basic diagnosis of the british economy is we're all about banking and we should be all about manufacturing and that is just nonsense like it's nonsense because the first isn't true we're actually pretty broad-based service economy, exporting all kinds. Yes, we have a large financial service sector, although its share of our exports has been falling significantly since the financial crisis. But we have huge other kinds of services. The creative industries, exports. for example. Yeah, huge creative industries. Business services. Yes, yeah, so business services more broadly. Yeah, all of these things are really important to us. Nobody talks about them ever in British policymaking or we just politics. Have. We just have. But, well, that's, that solved it then. <laughs> My basic point is, that is that the, the underlying nature of the British economy is that we are a service exporting, a services driven economy. We are the second biggest service exporter in the world. If we are going to be rich in the 21st century, it's going to be as a successful service economy. Doesn't mean we won't have some really important parts of our economy that are manufacturing. You know, you can see it in aerospace, you can see it in bits, some bits of food manufacturing. And in green energy, I mean, bits of... Yeah. Some, definitely, some Batteries, bits of green energy. solar farms. Right? Absolutely, I hope we are doing some of those things. But the big picture of the British economy isn't going to be that because we don't have enough Germans to suddenly... You know, you don't... The, the countries don't quickly change what they're very good at. They're, and people saying, I wish the economy was like X, are not engaging with the reality of what it is. You don't see countries suddenly becoming a very different kind of industrial mix over a short space of time, however much a politician would like that. And so, it, and then your policy needs to wrestle with the reality. Well, if that's the kind of economy you are, well, then your human capital is really important. Your trade policy needs to make sure you're opening access for those service sectors to do well in the world as you find it and that is an implicit like criticism of brexit isn't it because we don't have we have a brexit that's got freedom of you know, tariff free lots of access for goods but services was totally neglected yeah i mean that so that the big picture choice it, it, it is unusual for a large service exporter to basically pay no attention to service exports when negotiating a new trade arrangement with its largest partner now to be fair to the government doing that negotiation the EU had basically decided there wasn't going to be a negotiation on services. And this is what happens when you're a smaller party in a trade negotiation, which is, you know, once we've made our mind up that we want, didn't want the old deal, and we wanted a new deal. Well, the EU said to us, well, if you don't want to have any migration and you don't want to have any uh, broadly having the same rules governing lots of your service sector, it's not really available. And we'd made our mind up and we'd started the clock. And so we ended up in the situation we did. But yeah, look, on the, just on the economics of it, then it is a big problem that we don't have access for large parts of our service sector to the European market. Now, that particularly applies to regulated sectors. So that's law, bits of accountancy, obviously financial services. It's less clear to me that on, on less regulated sectors, so you talked about the creative industries, and there's lots of the business we need to do, we probably can still do and the trade barriers are much lower. But you probably would expect to see within our service sector a rebalancing away from regulated sectors to towards those less regulated sectors because of the way in which we've gone about Brexit. But your message is um, it's realistic, it's practical, um, but it's quite tough. I mean, you are saying that actually the economy we've got and the strengths we've got are the ones we've got to build on. And actually, uh, I, know, I mean... Uh, uh, I mean, many small towns, particularly in the Midlands and the north of England and Scotland and Wales, if, if there's no manufacturing, um, they're not going to become flourishing service sector centres. I mean, all that, that happens in cities. It's, I mean, your, yours is a great message for cities 
But it's a very bad message for towns and so I, villages. I think it? that is a that's a really good question. The um, and I think that is exactly the reason it's so important to recognise the kind of your economy you're going to be is partly because you can build on it and make a success of it. But it isn't just that. Serious social science is also looking at it to say, okay, if that's the kind of economy I'm going to be, what does that make difficult? What are the problems that come with that? Because you want to be addressing those and thinking about them, not just focusing on the good bit of the news. So you're right to say that if we're going to be a flourishing service economy, there are ways in which that could help us reduce gaps between regions. So making a success of Leeds, Manchester, Birmingham, and the rest would be a really good way of closing as a service led cities not just but like you know the likes of if you look at what the um you, know, you can see financial services in leeds you can see lots of creative industries in um and actually in bits of birmingham now you can see lots of creative industries and digital work in in uh, manchester yeah. and, and the, the cities and the it, universities yes the universities are in the cities i mean yeah. uh, so, well, but, and, but, they're, and they're flourishing and yeah. they and they're and they're and, be, and people are drawn to them but i mean but, but, that's, but don't but take that for granted the towns around no, no, saying, but, no, but i'm going to come to that but I hear too often people saying to me, oh, Leeds and Manchester are doing really well. The problem is that everyone else near, around them is being left behind. And that is complete nonsense. Our big cities outside the southeast of England, with the exception of Edinburgh, are far too low productivity, low wages. It is not true that their streets are lined with gold and it's all going brilliantly. And it's just like, you know, what's the poorest part of Greater Manchester? What's the poorest local authority in Greater Manchester? Manchester. It's Manchester itself. In, in the, Everyone always the, says to yeah, me, yeah. central Manchester's booming, we should only care about the poorer parts on the outside skirts. The poorest part in Greater Manchester is Manchester. People living in the middle of Greater Manchester. That, so let's not start taking for granted a bit of progress that started in some of our big cities because it is nowhere near sufficient to what we need. But then you do need a strategy that goes beyond that. You need that partly because success for those cities will actually be hard for people in the cities themselves. Because where a city gets better at a... Um, uh, advanced sectors that they then export. There are, they draws in higher earners. It has some benefits to higher earners with higher skills that are already there. It does raise employment for everybody, including those who are on lower earnings, but it doesn't raise wages for those at the bottom particularly, and it raises housing costs for everybody. So if you do make a success of your big cities outside London, you need to also work really hard to make sure the benefits of that are spread. So with inside the city, that's about your housing policy. Otherwise, those who already own property just capture all the benefits of economic success. But it also means making sure you're connecting places near that city centre to it, to, to opportunities. And that means skills, connecting them in terms of having the skills to be able to take up those opportunities. But it also means transport and the rest. And that is what we need to focus on. And remember, England is very small. And this is we're mainly talking about England here, but you know, Britain is quite small, but there's a lot of Scotland. But, the, but England where, and the population is not, the, you know, we talk about this, these are other lands. But if you put us in a European context or in an American context, it's tiny. Now, England is what? Um, it's a sixth or a seventh the size of France, the yeah. land area. I mean, whatever yeah. the figure it's is. It's pretty tiny. It? Yeah, I know. And so these economic geography problems, I don't think we should talk about. Like, it's really important to Oldham that Manchester itself is really successful. But as well as that, our promise isn't just... I think one of the problems we've got is that we talk as if the only jobs that should have status are exporting jobs, are the ones that are either to do with high-value manufacturing that's exporting or about city centres service jobs. And they aren't. They shouldn't be. That's a choice. There are loads of jobs in what I would call the non-tradable sector. So ones where you have to basically be near the people you are delivering the I mean, work to. For example, the chief executive of a think tank. I mean, exactly. I mean, <laughs> I'm highly non-tradable. You're very non-tradable. No, I meant more like I meant hairdressing. More. <laughs> but I meant like hairdressing, retail, hospitality. Okay, And these jobs, social care, these jobs exist in every part of the UK. They exist everywhere. And if you want a country that has economic opportunities for everyone and good jobs even if they are currently treated as low status jobs, then your economic policy also needs to directly target making those good quality jobs. And that will also come with trade-offs. So if you want social care work, which, as I say, exists in every town uh, and, and rural area and village in our country, then you will have to pay more for those jobs. We're going to have to do that anyway, by the way, because the volume of social care. But that comes with trade-offs because it probably means slightly higher taxes to pay for those jobs. Or if you want to make sure the hospitality jobs, which again exist everywhere, are better better jobs better paid well that comes in the con that also comes with a trade-off in terms of higher prices but countries that have higher wages in their non-tradable sectors and remember we just have we about our non-tradable sectors they are not subject to international competition you have policy choices about the nature of those jobs and different countries make different choices and the ones that choose higher pay for their non-tradable sectors which don't just exist in their big cities have lower inequality 
and better jobs at the price of consuming less of some of those things. You talk about jobs and you talk about uh, tax and you talk about choices that policymakers make. Um, but I mean, uh, the firm, the company that employs these people, I mean, you don't talk about that much. We haven't so, so far. Um, nor have you talked about, you know, what kind of le- the ecosystem in which kind of great companies are located. Um, you know, how are they financed? Uh, you know, wh- how do they get good people? Um, how are they governed? Uh, how are they managed? Um, why do we have so few of them? I mean, I, if, you, if you want these great jobs you're talking about, you've got to have great companies, haven't you? Uh, absolutely. And I think that is a fair, um, a fair critique of the project so far. It, so we're halfway through this project. Actually, a large chunk of the work stream that we in uh, the Centre for Economic Performance at LSE are doing for the next year is focused on the question of, OK, we all know business investment is very low in British firms and a complete disaster and a long-term driver of our lower productivity, particularly with the likes of France. Why is it so low and what can we do about it? And how much of that is related to exactly the ecosystem questions you're talking about? How much of it is about management and culture? How much of it about is the availability of the right kind of capital? Because everyone always says, oh, look, you know, the whole world's awash with cheap money. Although they're saying that less now, now that interest rates are heading up. But they would have, have been saying for the last decade, the world's awash with cheap money. But stepping back to the real issues about who is able to actually, what kind of money, you know, how much of that is rooted in the UK? How much can firms get it on what kind of terms? Why don't some firms want to invest? Why don't they want to grow particularly? Those are the questions that we're focusing on in the next year because I think that is a both a fair critique of the project so far and also that project so far has pointed to needing to solve that problem if we're going to get this economy on a higher growth trajectory. That's been my kind of pre- preoccupation exactly. <laughs> the last three or four decades. You can come and tell uh, us the answer. I, I, have a, I have a... Yeah, cracking it is really, is really tricky, but I think it's to do with... Um, deficiencies in the way we think about ownership I think it's to do with the way in which public companies are owned um, it's to do with the short time horizons of the private equity industry which is in some respects quite dynamic but owns an increasing swathe of uh, the British economy uh, uh, and it has mandates to kind of make money over a five or ten year period and that's tricky you know I mean you've got to start talking about time horizons you've got to talk about incentives you've got to talk about yeah, and again, I mean, you talked. Uh, you said you had to do big things about inequality. You got to do big things, I think, uh, in the way our institutional yeah, arrangements. Uh, so watch this space, Will. I promise. Torsten, Torsten Bell, thank you so much. You have uh, uh, over the course of the last period, you've discussed and you have looked at the problems that we've been discussing through a social science prism. You've made the connection between the social and the economic. You've made the connection in particular between what's happening in the labour market and inequality in people's lived lives. Um, you recognise that there's, that your analysis has got more to do uh, in the sense that a lot of what you've been talking about has derived from this great study, Stagnation Nation. Look forward to kind of where that's going to go. But above all, um, the alpha and omega of um, your thinking is, kind of, is that uh, inequality and low growth are interconnected and they're toxic and you've got to solve them both and you've got to do it through a social science lens thank you very much indeed thank you will thank you so much for joining in the conversation the we society is brought to you by the academy of social sciences acss.org.uk i'm will hutton the producer is emily finch and it's a whistle down production if you haven't already please subscribe to the podcast Leave a comment, share with your colleagues and friends, or send us an email and tell us what we should be asking and who we should talk to.